And um, so I want to just walk you through the road of, of Jesus, the, his final week when he was um, here on earth before he was crucified. And this is just so important. And there's a couple of points that I want to highlight. I'm going to try to highlight something in each day, but there's just way too much there. I do want you to know something um, important and something that you need to know that in all the Gospels. Now, I want you to, uh, do you guys, how many of you guys know, how, how long was Jesus' ministry? How long was his ministry? Okay, three years. So in three years, everything that he did, which was amazing, he did so many things. Do you know that in all the Gospels, at least one quarter, so in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one quarter of the chapter deals with the last week of Jesus' life. In the book of John, half of the book of John is dealing with the last week of Jesus on the earth. And this is important to understand because of how important this week is, Passion Week, and what Jesus did for us. So um, there's so many, of, of course, nothing can replace or ever uh, be greater than Jesus' work on the cross. When, you know, the, the, uh, John 3.16 says what? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So the greatest gift of all that the father gave was that he sent his son. Do you, do you, can you understand the power of the fact that every time you sin and you mess up, the power of freedom and the power of forgiveness is in the name of Jesus because of what he did come on now sin separates us from God but Jesus and his name and his work and his finished work on the cross and his resurrection brings freedom and brings healing and brings forgiveness so the thing is the week before on Saturday so this is actually technically two Saturdays before, so eight. So we're looking at basically eight days right here. So Saturday uh, before Jesus was, uh, two, yeah, let's just say eight days before uh, everything, before Jesus' resurrection, I'll say it like that. Um, you see here that it says that he had dinner in Bethany at Lazarus' house, and of course this is where Mary anoints Jesus' feet. Now I want you to, I want to highlight this this morning. I want you to see the extravagant worship that Mary gave Jesus. The extravagant worship, could you imagine opening up this, this jar, this perfume, and she takes it, and it, it's worth a year's wages. Whatever the median income for a person in the United States is, let's just call it, I didn't, I didn't Google this or anything, but let's just say it's $30,000 the average person makes or whatever a year. Could you imagine taking a $30,000 ointment and rubbing it on Jesus' feet or on someone's feet? And then what she does as an act of total humility and total surrender, saying, I know who you are, she takes her own hair and wipes off his feet. You say, well, how can Jesus let her do that? That was called extravagant love. Extravagant worship. I want to say something to the men. In years past, I feel like in my life, because of my relationship with my earthly father, when I talk about intimacy with the Father, I feel like because of my dad on earth, it has been easy to make that transition in understanding how awesome of a father God is. But I want to say something to you, and I, and I have sometimes not, not apologized, but sometimes I've said to the men, hey, I know you may not understand this because your reference maybe of what you went through is nothing like maybe like what I went through on the earth. But I want to say this to you, that God the Father is not boxed in, and his love that you can have passionately for, for, for him is not limited to your earthly experience. You, man, you can experience the love of a father. And when he calls us the bride, even though we're men, we can know as men we are married to God. We are married to him. You can experience that. Don't limit your father's relationship to what you experience with your dad. And I don't limit mine to my dad. When I grew up, 
communication was not big in our home. There was a lot of affection, but there wasn't a lot of communication. I can count on, I could remember probably on one hand the major conversations I had with my earthly father growing up. Deep conversations, maybe five. Now that changed when he got born again and, and he began to open up and, and God began to do things in his life and now we do communicate. But I want to say this to you, but when I received Jesus, I just realized that he always talked. God always talked. He's always wanting to talk. So don't limit. Listen, God is worthy of extravagant worship. He's worthy of the tears that you cry when you pray and call out to him. He's worthy of all of those things. He's worthy of worship. He's so worthy. Listen, so Sunday comes along, and of course, this is what we're celebrating here is Palm Sunday. And so what happens is, is of course, Jesus rides in on a donkey. We all know the story and one of the, there's two main things that are noticeable about this point in history is this, is that what the people did as he was coming in uh, to Jerusalem, they laid down palm branches, but they also laid down cloaks. Now, why did they do that? And I know you guys know this, but it's worth repeating. But that was the custom of what they did for when a king was coming into town. So when a king would come into town after victory, they would lay down palm branches. I know this is a flower, okay. But they would lay down the palm branches and they would lay down their cloaks in representation. Wow, the king had victory. Now these people were trying to get Jesus to be the king of Israel again. They were thinking like, oh, we need a King David. We need... But what did Jesus say? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Come on now. He was trying to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. That's what he was trying to do, to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. So that, of course, he comes into Jerusalem, and, um, and that night he stays again over at Lazarus' house in Bethany. Now, Monday, Monday, I won't get into the fig tree because there's, that's just way too much time. But let's look at Luke 1940, 1946 there. It says, my house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. What happened? Jesus went into the temple, and he saw these people buying and selling doves and changing money, and they were just doing business like as if the house of God was some kind of, you know, uh, uh, just, just nothing, you know? And, but he said, no, my temple, my place will be a house of prayer. And do you know that for you and for me, do you know what God is desiring, Shane? God is desiring that because he said now in the New Testament, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know what he desires? He's saying that you will be a house of prayer. You are a house of prayer. You are a house of prayer. When I prayed earlier, listen, I, wanna, I, I just want to be real with you guys. When I prayed earlier, everything I prayed, I believe. I was not praying over you, trying to work my faith up. And sometimes you have to work your faith up. But if you've been with him, it comes out of you like that. I believe what I said to you. I know that I know it was in the atmosphere. You know why? Because I have made a decision that this temple, this right here, will be a house of prayer. Come on now. Praise God. How, how valuable do you think that the temple is for God, that he would go in and he would say, this is unclean. And you want to know something? If you learn the love, if you, listen, if you really learn the love of the Father, it is no problem to invite him in and say, is there anything in me that you want to do? Is there anything in Erwin that you need to deal with me on? See, when you love and you know the love of the Father, the invitation to ask him, God, would you purify me? See, because some people, they say, well, you know what? How, how much are you going to ask God to purify you? Jesus paid for all sin on the cross. See, but you know what? See, that's, that, that, that's beautiful, and he did pay for all sin, but I want to let you know something. 
I still deal with stuff. Do you? I still deal with this world, Pastor Daniel. I still deal with things. And you want to know something? Listen, I'm not striving for perfection. I just, I just want him to know you can come in through the front door of this temple and deal with me. Because I know it's important to you. And you know what? Some of us are not there. Some of us, you know, you know, we're walking. That's why this is a walk with God. He didn't say it's a sprint. He said it's a walk. Have I always been like this? No. But as I've gotten to know him, I have opened up the chambers of my heart and asked him to be more and more and more a part of everything that I do. Come on now. Man, I would love to just stay here. But listen, so he cleanses the temple. Now let's go to Tuesday. Tuesday, there is a lot going on in Tuesday. But the one thing that I want to highlight, you could look at this on your own time, but this is the Tuesday is when Judas negotiates with the Sanhedrin to betray Jesus. Judas negotiates a deal. He said, how much will you give me? If I get him to you, come on now. And I want to say this to you. Judas had a choice. I know that the Bible says he was doomed for destruction, but I want to let you know something that if that I believe with all my heart, had he waited a little longer before he committed suicide, he could have been forgiven for his sin, just like Peter was. Just like Peter was. And don't you ever diminish. We're going to get to this in a moment. But don't you ever diminish the power of God's mercy and forgiveness. Because I want to let you know that thief on the cross, when he was on the cross, all he said, he said, Jesus, will you remember me? Will you just remember me? And Jesus said, today, this day, you'll be with me in paradise. If you're ever seeing a body laid out in a coma, begin to speak to that person. You say, well, they can't hear you. Trust me when I tell you, they'll hear you. And I've spoken to people that have been comas, and I said, hey, Gary, listen, right now, if you would surrender your heart to Jesus, make him your Lord and Savior, just say, I believe in you. I believe if you took your last breath right now, brother, you would you would be in heaven forever. Because God knows what? He knows the heart. He knows the heart. That thief on the cross didn't pray no sinner's prayer. He just said, remember me. He looked at the other thief and he said, why are you cursing him? We deserve what we got. But this man has done nothing. Hallelujah. Let's go to Wednesday. Wednesday intrigues me so much because they call it Silent Wednesday. There is nothing recorded that Jesus did, taught, taught, or anything. It's just silence. Silence. I want to tell some of you a word. And I would love to get into this, and maybe I can get into it in a couple of weeks, but y'all need to understand something huge. We got Passover coming which, of course, for us, we celebrate resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all this. Listen, you guys need to understand something. We don't have to celebrate the feasts the way the Jews did, but the feasts for us these days is not about us doing and going to the temple or, or, or the Passover and all this. I want you to hear me. You need to understand something. On God's calendar, times and seasons, he has times and seasons. And this season that we're coming into right now, next week, some of you, this is what I want to tell you, the enemy is trying to come against you to forfeit what you can can do in this next season. He's trying to get you to forfeit it. God works in seasons. Be faithful. Listen, if you feel lately that you have been tempted more than normal, I want to tell you something. There is a reason for that. And it's not coming from God. The enemy is trying to get you to forfeit what you would, what would take place in the near future in your life. That's a word for somebody. It's not for everybody, but that's for somebody. Because you need to be careful. 
You need to know and learn in your walk with God. When you see a bunch of stuff happening around you, you need to smile and know that stupid devil, what he's trying to do, he's, he's just giving him, he just showed me all his cards. He just showed me all his cards. You need to know that. Come on, man, don't be, don't be ignorant. This is powerful what I'm saying to you. So Wednesday was silent. Now Thursday was the preparation of the Passover. You can turn your page over. Amen. <clears throat> now, of course, this is amazing. This is where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Judas, of course, was right over a meal signaled as the traitor. Now, you all know that Jesus knew he was the traitor before they went into the deal, right? Okay, but, you know, so he still sat with them. And, and let me say this to you. Man, sometimes you'll just stare right at your enemy and all you can do is just smile. But you know what? God is with you. Fulfill your destiny. Fulfill your purpose. Amen? Don't listen to the negative things that people would say against you. Jesus warns the apostles against desertion, like the, that, hey, listen, there's, there's going to be attacks. There's going to be, you know, a, a, you guys, are, it's not going to be easy. Let me tell you, we live in a world right now, and, and let me tell you, in California, it is not popular to be a Christian in California. It's not popular. If you believe the Bible. Now, if you want to submit to society and you want to submit to all the way it does things, well, then you'll just fit right in. There's a good word for that. It's called lukewarm. But Jesus said this. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but not in the middle. Try riding your car along the, the middle of the road on that yellow line and see what happens to you. Listen, it's time to be hot. It's time to be hot, huh, Nat? It's time to be hot. Be hot for God. Be hot. You can be hot physically too, but be hot for Jesus, okay? All right. I had to make you laugh at least once, okay? Listen. <laughs> Nat's praying for the... Oh, I'm just... I'm, I'm not going to say it, okay? <clears throat> Jesus is betrayed. They arrest Jesus. And, of course, it's one of the things that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane is that Peter takes out his sword and he cuts off this soldier's ear named Malchus. What a powerful story to know that in Peter trying to defend Jesus carnally, by, not, by, not by the spirit, but by the flesh. Because, you know, these people were real. You know, these people were fishermen, tax collectors. These people were real people. You know what I mean? It's like when I look at Aquanetta, I laugh. It's like, I know Jesus is in her, but God forbid somebody just pokes the bear and does something. I'll be like, Jesus, please calm her down. You know what I'm saying? Because she's still got street in her, you know? But, we all, we're all, but we're all working things out. Peter was working things out. Listen, and you know what Jesus did? Man, he knew what they were going to do to him. What does Jesus do? Jesus picks up, come on now, picks up the ear and puts it right on the man's head. And he's healed. He's healed. Come on now. Isn't that good? I just want to read this paragraph to you. But it says, later Jesus and the disciples left the upper room and went to the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed in agony to God the Father. Luke's gospel says his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Late that evening in Gethsemane, Jesus was betrayed with a kiss by Judas Iscariot. He was arrested by the Sanhedrin. He was taken to the home of Caiaphas, the, the high priest, where the whole council had gathered to begin making their case against Jesus. Meanwhile, in the early morning hours, as Jesus' trial was getting underway, Peter denied knowing his master three times before the rooster crowed. Remember Jesus? Remember Peter was the one who said, man, I will never leave you. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And he said, even before this night is over, you will deny me three times. And Peter denied. At one point, he said this in one of the gospels. He said, he says, I have nothing to do with that man. Could you imagine that? But isn't, isn't Jesus so good after his resurrection? What does he tell, what does he tell the disciples? He said, he said, tell, he goes, oh, I'm sorry, he told Mary, tell the disciples and Peter. 
man, come on, isn't God so good? Isn't God so good? Man, if you ever feel that you are just too dirty and too bad and you can't ever come back to God, listen, tell that voice to shut up. Because I don't believe anybody in this place has ever said, right, Renee? I don't know anyone who's, I, I, don't, I can't even imagine any of y'all saying, I have nothing to do with him. Even, I can't even say that without some fear in my, in my in, you know, even as I'm just saying an example. I bet you, none of you, you may, I bet you even in a setting where people don't like Christians and you feel like a little uncomfortable, like out of place and, you know, people like, oh, they're going to think I'm a Jesus freak. I guarantee you none of you have ever said, I have nothing to do with him. I'm going to roll with you guys. But Peter said it. And Jesus is so good. And he said, tell the disciples and Peter. Come on now. Hallelujah. Let me finish up here because I, 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 just, I just feel like the Lord moved and he did what he needed to do. So, so on Friday, I want to go down just to, uh, you can study of all the trials that Jesus went through. But I just want to give you some bottom lines. 8 a.m., Pilate condemns Jesus to death. At 9 a.m., Jesus is crucified. At 12 noon, darkness covers the land. And at 3 p.m., Jesus dies. Supernatural phenomena accompanying Jesus' death began to take place. There was darkness and earthquake. And the top of the temple, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And Saturday, his body was in the tomb. And hallelujah, Sunday was the resurrection. Hallelujah. I want to I wanna show you guys something real quick. I woke up one morning and I went to, I had to go to the store and on my dashboard, not on my dashboard, on my window of my car. Randy, can you help me out with this, brother? <clears throat> so I just want to show you this. So this was on my window at my apartment. All right, just stretch it a little bit. It won't break. So can you guys see that a little bit? That is the actual picture and this is a real, like a photo, like someone took this photo. It's a picture of, of the tomb where Jesus was buried. And you know what's amazing about that? Because you can Google these images and stuff. It, it's actually a neighbor who left it on there. He took this in Israel, and he put it on my windshield. And I was like, man, that's amazing. But you want to know something? Here's the deal. The tomb is empty. It's a great picture. But if you go in that tomb, there's nobody there. They have gone into the tombs of King Tut. They have gone into the tombs of all these pharaohs. And you see the bones and the rings and all that stuff. But if you go into this tomb on this king, you won't find him there. Because he's seated on the right hand of the Father. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah. Come on, give him praise. Now, I want to I tell you this one last thing. I want to tell you this one last thing, and I just challenge you, take time to just, in your Bible, just this week, take time to study, um, uh, you know, just, just the road that Jesus went through. Everything that I told you, these scriptures, you can find in all those chapters. Take time to know um, uh, just the road that Jesus went through for you and for me. But I want to say this, you know, there were seven things that God said um, on the cross, and I just thought this was just so powerful, but just, you know, some of them are just regular things that we, even we just talked about, but, but just, you know, the first thing he said was, Father, forgive them. When he was on the cross, the first thing he said out of his mouth was, Father, forgive them. The second thing he said to the thief on the cross, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. I just think it's so amazing. The first thing he says is, Father, forgive them. And the second thing he says out of his mouth as he's crucified on the cross, still alive, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. The third thing he did, he addressed John and he said, dear woman, here is your son. And of course, he told John, here is your mother. And basically what he was doing, he was just saying, hey, take care of her. Amen. 
I know the Catholics. I, I, I have most of my family's Catholic. I love Catholic people. They love Jesus, you know, and stuff like that. I have nothing to say, but we don't worship Mary. We worship Jesus. Amen. God used Mary, and we honor her, but we worship Jesus. Mary did not die for your sins. You don't have to go through Mary. This is, isn't this great? You don't have to go through Mary or anybody else to get the Father's attention. The Bible says this. All you have to do is just say one name, Jesus. That's all. That's the only thing you got to say. You don't need two keys on the keychain. You just need one to start the car. Listen, and his name is Jesus. Amen. Now, those, those things happen from 9 to 12 a.m., but from 12 to 3, he said this. He said, my God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? Then he said, I am thirsty. The third, the, the sixth thing he said, he said, it is finished. And the seventh and the last thing he said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just give him praise this morning. Can you just thankful? Hallelujah. Just, just, we just appreciate Jesus so much and what he's done. And I want to tell you guys this morning that we prayed and, and God, would you please receive what took place this morning. Please receive the spirit of what took place because God was answering prayers this morning. And that was my prayer for you guys. Amen. Amen. Let me say, let me just say this final prayer. So, Father, we love you so much. We give you praise. God, as we begin to prepare to celebrate this amazing time next week called Resurrection Sunday, we ask, Father, that you would just stir in our hearts this week, God. Unlike any other time in the year, not even Christmas. Christmas is second, but it's still not first. Unlike any other time of the year, this is the time that people are open to Jesus. So, Father, I pray that you use us and give us divine appointments, that you would show us those people that we would run into that need you, God. Let us be sensitive, Father. Let us take a step of faith and do something that we've never maybe even done before, and that is speak to someone and tell them about the love of God. So, Father, we praise you this morning. We give you glory. We thank you that you moved in power and might earlier. We do lift up your name. And, Lord, we just thank you that we say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna means, Lord, save us. They were prophesying as they laid those palm branches down on the floor. They were prophesying to their children and their children's children and generations, Lord, save us. Father, would you continue to honor that prayer, Hosanna, and save people, God. Use us to win the lost. We love you, God. You're worthy and worthy and worthy of praise. We thank you. Jesus name. Amen. Can we ask the ushers to get ready this morning? We're going to honor God with our giving.